Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next session of the PML reading group. This is actually the last. So today we'll be covering chapter eight on optimization. And this is actually the last chapter uh, in the foundations section of the book. Um, next week, we'll be moving on to uh, the to the linear models uh, section. And once again, we're very happy to have Anton um, Solitsky presenting. So Anton, um, take it away. Thank you, Pierre. Okay. So hello, everybody. And I will start sharing my screen. Okay, uh, today we will cover the chapter about optimization. And um, this is the central problem for all, I think, algorithms in machine learning and deep learning, because they're still not well. Um, Are not clear and not well um, studied. But some of uh, the cases are studied um, completely. So uh, we will talk about linear and nonlinear optimization, convex and non convex optimization smooth and non-smooth optimization. And uh, unfortunately, in many cases, uh, at least in deep learning, we have non-convex, non-smooth, non-linear functions. And probably that's why uh, we have so many research in this field for, <laughs> because it's there is no theory for optimization. So uh, today I will cover the well-studied approaches um, for smooth convex optimization, first and second order methods, then um, convex optimization and the dual problems. Um, of course, uh, Kuntaker theorem and the, the core of probabilistic approaches to machine learning expectation maximization algorithm. So let's get started. Uh, the definition of maximum or minimum is given in this slide. I just wanted to um, remind you that um, if we look at, at x2, this point is the local maximum. But also x equals 3 is also the local maximum, as well as local minima. Uh, because in the definition, there is um, not strict the inequality. So it's just good to remember this example when we will talk about the maximum. The global maximum here is only one at zero. Uh, the global minimum is only one at zero. But um, there are many uh, local maximum. As well as at, at min minus one, we have also local maximum. 
So let's start from the simplest case of convex function. Convex means that it has only one local minimum. And well, it's not the definition. The definition um, can be given by the second line, but in or there is another definition that if I take two points, then the line from one point to another one belongs to the epigraph of the function. So uh, convex function and smooth. Uh, by smooth, we mean that it has the first derivative in multidimensional case gradient. And this gradient is Lipschitz. Um, so I denoted constant L1. I will denote L for Lipschitz condition on the function L1 on the gradient and L2 on the second gradient Hessian. So as I said, I mentioned before, if a function is convex, then the following inequality is satisfied. Um, I can just uh, draw here the picture of the convex function. If we take the any point x and x plus h, then um, if we calculate the derivative and draw the slope, then it's obvious it will be smaller than the value of function. So just illustration. Um, so now let's consider the difference of the function, uh, which can be represented as integral if it's, it has derivative um, from zero to one. Um, if we integrate, then we will have f at x plus h minus f at x plus zero. So exactly the difference. Therefore, um, from the first, the second line inequality, we have that this difference is non-negative. And from the first inequality of the literal condition, we can estimate the integral. So this is by Lipschitz condition smaller than L1 times H. After integration, we'll get L1 H squared over two. So we have lower and upper boundary for our function, which is very nice um, because um, we can um, optimize or lower bound or upper bound, and then we will converge to the minimum of our function. So this is the idea of the first order methods. The first order methods, um, in, we optimize our function in the, in the direction of its gradient. And the optimization procedure is given below. Then x, the next um, point x, k plus one, is calculated by the first x, 
minus uh, a constant step um, times the gradient of the function. Why can we use the constant step? Because when we go closer to uh, the minimum, then the function is more flat and the derivative is smaller. So we don't need to change the step because the derivative is changing. If we have constrained optimization, let's denote uh, constraints by the set Q, then we sh should to take the, the step, um, this optimization step, but um, along this direction, but we should care about uh, that we are still satisfy the constraints. Okay. Um, what can we do in case of non-smooth functions? In, so we don't have the condition on the Lipschitz con Lips condition on the derivatives. Then we have the following estimation. Um, by convex uh, convexity, the first part is the same, but the second part is a little bit different. We don't have. Um... Can I ask a question? <clears throat> yes, sure. From the last slide, uh, how we get the lower bound and upper bound? Well. Um, because we have uh, we have two in inequalities. The first so it's these are our assumptions. The first is the Lipschitz on the gradient. The second is convexity. So if um, okay, if um, second I will annotate. Um, so if you um, put these terms on this side, you will get the first inequality. Um, or if you just reverse this, um, this uh, you will get, so, the first lower bound is just the second inequality. Uh, what about the upper bound? Um, we represent the difference as integral. So we represent the difference as integral. Uh, because integral, the um, What we call the derivative and inverse um, um, but I forget the name um, for the inverse operation, but um, anyways, integral of the derivative will be the function f. So uh, it, I hope this formula is clear that the difference can be represented as integral. Yeah, I understand the okay. lower inequality. Okay, then um, uh, we can estimate, or then we can write instead of the, this difference, oops, this difference integral. So this part. But the second function doesn't depend on tau. So we can just, um, and integral over tau is just one. So we can write the second term um, under integral because it's constant. 
uh, and and after this we can apply the first inequality and the first inequality says that this whole thing is smaller than h and the difference is x minus one and in my case it will be just um h tau because we should subtract x plus tau h minus x so it's it will be tau h you take integral over tau so it will be one half so it's h, h squared over two um does it make sense now yeah thank you you're welcome oops oh i closed um okay uh, in case of non-smooth function we don't have the upper bound um are you still sharing your screen, Anton? Oh, sorry. I I probably clicked on stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, now let's look at the, in the case of non-smooth. In case of non-smooth functions. Um, we don't have this upper bound, but um, people define the notion of subgradient, which is denoted by this partial derivative in Murphy's book. Uh, subgradient is an any um, tangent line which is below our convex function so this is the set of these lines um, and only one um, thing that we can um, say about this uh, subgradient is that the direction the slope of this line and the angle of this line with the direction to the minimum point, um, the uh, is occult. The cosine of this angle is non-negative. So we can use this again as the direction of optimization of our function and the. Uh, algorithm in this case is given by this formula again we uh, go in the direction but not of derivative of sub differential and in this case um, we should take care about this step so the Um, I'm not sure if it's theorem or general um, rule. The, the um, we should take smaller steps when we go closer to the minimum. Um, now, this was the well-known approach for optimization. Um, now let's um, look at um, different variants of this approach. Um, there are two uh, directions. Um, in one direction, direction, we can estimate this gradient 
And in another direction, another direction of methods is the changing of the step size. So let's talk about the first one, about the estimation of gradients. Um, usually we have n data points and some model like linear regression, for example, um, which is given by um, vector of weights times uh, our data point. Then um, in this case, our target function is represented as a sum of functions. And um, instead of evaluating of gradient for each term of this sum, um, we can estimate only gradient for one term, fi. And um, this is called stochastic gradient descent. So in gradient descent, we calculate the derivative of the entire function. In case of stochastic gradient descent, we calculate the, um, the we, we assume that the gradient just on one data point is approximately the same as the uh, gradient over all data points, which is not bad assumption and the commonly used practice. The other approach is to use mini batch. Uh, that means that we evaluate the gradient over L lowercase um, data points and take the average of these estimations, um, which gives better estimation. And why people use that? Because if we have a very large data set, then it's difficult time uh, consuming to calculate gradient over all data points. And even though the estimation is not um, correct, but because we need to estimate um, over just a few points, we, we have a huge um, advantage in time. So, um, one step um, takes much less time than in this case, and not non accuracy of gradient um, um, we take we should take more steps because of not accuracy, but each step requires much less time. Okay, let's, um, so, but this were very simple. Everybody knows about that. And also I hope everybody is familiar with another approach of um, modernization of gradient descent there. Um, changing the, start, the step size. So here we have, Four methods, momentum. Let's uh, start from this one. Uh, so imagine we have this counter plot of our target function. If you take the gradient here and do the step, um, we'll change the color. 
the step, we can overshoot our next control level. And it will go like zigzag. Installation. To avoid this, uh, the method of momentum was introduced. Um, so we update our step according to the previous direction of optimization. And um, if we add, for example, to the second line, we add the first line, then the result will, will be smaller. So the method of momentum was introduced to, to uh, keep track of this uh, sign change of the gradient. Um, the next uh, um, modification other grad was introduced for sparse for sparse data because if we have the vector um, x of data um, uh, consistent mostly of zeros, then um also the optimization step will be along just non-zero coordinates and um, it can make a huge gain over a single coordinate which um, this other grad method uh, tries to to um, to diminish. So um, they introduced the um, additional factor j depending on the steps k plus one and the coordinate of our data point. And each step they divide by this factor, um, it means if the derivative in this direction very big, then we divide it and it makes um, our vector more smooth in the, in, in the sense of coordinates. And uh, the next method is um, RMS prop, root mean square propagation is just a slight modification of other grad. So it's just the weighted sum. Um, and the, the last, um, most common method used in deep learning, the Adam, adaptive momentum, not because of the person Adam, um, is the combination of the momentum method and RMS probe. And I just want uh, to mention the story of the RMS probe method that there is no paper about this method because this method was introduced during lecture of the famous um, Geoffrey Hinton course of machine learning. Um, and after 
she called it uh, RMS probe. And after that, uh, people started to use it, but there is no good reference to this method. I think it's a cool fact um, that lectures could come up with a new method in their lecture. Okay. Let's uh, move on. The next slide. Okay, uh, second order methods. Um, the second order methods use the information of the second derivative. And um, because it's difficult to calculate in the previous presentation, I introduce the stochastic approach to estimate the Hessian using um, the Hutchinson uh, estimation. But it's uh, still um, time consuming and uh, well, but now people are trying to, to find better estimation. Anyways, um, usually people don't use the second order methods for deep learning. They use now using these estimations, but um, it's just the new practice. So anyways, uh, we have to uh, optimize the function f and um, in, by, by definition, the local minimum is, um, or sorry, not definition by the theorem, the, that in the uh, local minimum, the gradient is zero. So instead of optimized function, we can try to solve this equation number two, the gradient equals zero. And this leads us to the Newton's method. Newton's method uh, for solution of the system of linear equations. So we try to linearize the function f and um, to solve this, uh, to linearize uh, the system of equations too, sorry. And uh, to solve this, uh, this system. So the update state uh, step in this case has this form. Um, and um, we use the inverse of Hessian. And the condition of convergence is the um, Lipschitz condition on the second derivative. There is another, um, uh, how to say, this method uh, is very difficult uh, to use for functions with non-convex functions with several local minima. And um, also there is a problem if the Hessian is, uh, The uh, degenerative, so it's the, it's determined to zero. So um, the modification of this method was introduced in the 90s. And summarizing this book by Kohn, Gould, and Point. Um, so this modification is using trust region method. So they just take the ball and uh, if there is a problem in this ball, they change the size of this ball, they change this delta K and try to do again this, this optimization step and so on. So this is the idea of the trust region method. 
And finally, they find at least one ball where the next value of a function will be lower than the previous one. Um, let's talk uh, briefly about another class of optimization uh, problems, so-called convex optimization uh, with constraints. Assume that we have a function, the target function f0 um, with constraints fi of inequality type and hj of the equality type. Um, then we can construct the following function f um, where we um, include information about constraints. So this um, characteristic functions i are defined as follows. If we satisfy, if x is in our um, solution set, then it's zero. But if it doesn't satisfy the constraints, then we uh, put a very high um, a penalty, a penalty to this function. So in this case, it's just infinity. So it means that if X doesn't satisfy the constraints, this function is infinite. If it satisfies, we have only the first term. Of course, um, we can't work with such functions. <laughs> so, uh, which are zero and then immediately infinity. But we can use like rectified function, which is zero and then a linear function. Um, this will lead us to the notion of Lagrangian. So in this case, we use here this linear functions of constraints. If lambdas are non-negative, then it's easy to see that um, the infinitum of this Lagrangian is always over the entire Rn. It's always smaller than infinite of this Lagrangian over constraint set. Why? Because if x is in our uh, constraint, then the last term is zero because h are the equality type constraints. And the second term um, is non-negative because of uh, lambda. But uh, Um, and F um, wait a second, and F are negative. Um, so Um, hmm. I should use the 
the positive here sign because um, um, if lambda positive and f positive, then the sum is positive and the minimum will be um, when lambda is zero. Um, okay. Yeah, probably I made a mistake. I'll double check. And um, so in this case, the minimization of this Lagrangian over constraints is the same as maximization of this uh, auxiliary function without constraints. Uh, well, just one lambda is not negative. And um, in this case, the solution of the minimization problem is for f is the same as the solution of maximization problem for g. And this is uh, called strong duality condition. It is satisfied under the necessary condition uh, no sufficient condition for this is given by Slater's condition. So Slater's condition says that all the functions f and should be convex and um, functions h should be linear. And uh, I think the inequality sign was correct, but because here I'm using negative and uh, there should be at least one point uh, satisfying the constraints and in this case the optimization problem with constraints can be turned into minimization problem without constraints which is much um, which is well studied Okay, um, and uh, okay, and uh, there is um, Kuntaker theorem that says that um, these conditions are not only sufficient but also necessary. Okay, um, let's move ahead on the EM algorithm and I will double check the sign after the presentation. Okay, now this is my favorite topic because it's the probabilistic um, optimization um, approach. Let's uh, consider that we have N data points I will use this upper index for the um, data point. And um, we know the distribution of these data points given some other um, variables. Uh, you can think about the hidden variable, uh, like in PCA, for example, when we try to reduce the dimension, and X is like higher dimensional data, and Z is lower dimensional data, and uh, and we know the model. In PCA, for example, x equals the matrix W times Z plus bias. So we know the conditional probability. And also we know the um, lower space or hidden variable space, um, distribution. In PCA, it's um, normal distribution. Um, but we uh, don't know exactly the 
matrices W and Vice, for example, we will denote this by parameters theta. So the goal of this algorithm is to find these parameters. And how much time do we have? Okay. Probably I will take extra five or 10 minutes to finish it. Yeah, Anton, that's fine. We actually have an hour and a half, so. Yes, yeah, okay, but uh, because like uh, originally we were said that one hour for presentation, one hour for discussion. So I'm trying to, to be in the frame. Okay, um, so we can write the joint probability, which is called in the literature, um, complete data probability. And this probability is usually called, oh, um, um, this this probability x on the on the data x is usually uh, called incomplete data because originally as i understand this approach was introduced to deal with missing data so all the data were said uh, were called complete data and um, uh, data without some points missing data were called incomplete data. So this is uh, the terminology, but um, we can talk about the joint distribution and um, marginal distribution in terms of probabilities. So the joint distribution by the uh, definition of the conditional probability is given by this uh, formula, the condition times um, marginal. And uh, usually um, the lower dimensional data, um, their distribution, doesn't depend on any parameters. So usually you can see here just P of Z without parameters, like standard normal, for example. Okay, so this is the setting of the problem. Now let's define the likelihood. The likelihood is the product of um, the complete likelihood. Um, so complete, in my case, um, I use analogy as the latent variable Z, but if we talk about missing data, you can think about Z like missing data, then it's complete data likelihood. Um, it's the product of the joint probabilities for each data point. And of course we will take later the logarithm to work with sums instead of products. And our goal um, is to find parameters theta, but we don't know anything about this missing data or latent variable Z. We can work only with this incomplete probability P of X given parameters. So this probability can be obtained as marginalization of our joint probability. And then we can uh, maximize this incomplete likelihood with respect to parameters theta. So this is the settings of our problem. So now we have probabilistic uh, problem. And uh, uh, let's uh, elaborate a little bit this likelihood. So likelihood 
depends on the parameters and data x, but I don't, uh, x are given our data points, we can't uh, change them. So we will be interested only in um, estimation of parameters theta. So I don't use, uh, I don't write the dependence of x. Um, so let's uh, do the following. Yeah, let's take logarithm, then the log of sum of the product is the sum of logarithms, but then multiply by an arbitrary distribution Q, um, the integral of any distribution is zero, is one. So uh, we don't change anything here. And then um, we use the conditional uh, definition. So we write this x as um, p of x as p of, um, well, exactly we should use it twice, but um, I skipped here one um, step. So we can um, get this um, expression for P of X and then multiply numerator and denominator by the same probability Q. And then split this logarithm into two logarithms. Um, so the first is the numerator over Q and the second is Q over denominator. And uh, am I missing minus here? Oh, no, I don't because um, yeah, I didn't split the uh, fractions. So, uh, the second term, uh, if you remember, uh, there was the third uh, presentation in our reading group um, where how divergence was introduced. So the last term is the uh, the Kulbach-Leibler divergence, the analog of proximity of two distributions. And um, so it has nice properties that we will use later, like non-negativity. And the first term uh, we will denote by this functional L, this functional of this unknown distribution Q and parameters theta. And this functional is usually called evidence lower boundary elbow. Uh, for now, it looks that we complicated the problem, but you will see that actually it will lead us to the solution. So uh, let's elaborate the first term a little bit. Um, instead of using the sum over data points, we can use these capital letters where uh, I use this notation, the distribution over all data is the same as the product because of the assumption of independence. Uh, because in literature, sometimes you can see um, these notations. Sometimes you can see the notation only for one data point without sum, and uh, it can be confusing. So I try to um, explain these notations. So um, it's not nothing else as the expectation expectation with respect to this. Um, introduced distribution skew. And this will 
all, is, this also probably gave the name of this algorithm expectation maximization. On the next slide, you will uh, see why it's the case. So, as I said before, the second term, uh, pullback Lidler, the divergence is always uh, non negative. And it equals zero only when these distributions uh, uh, coincide. Okay. Uh, so in this notation, our um, likelihood function can be written as formula nine with put terms. And um, because of non-negativity of the KL divergence, this likelihood can be estimated as in this second line by this evidence lower boundary, L capital, photographic one. And the whole idea of the algorithm is given by these two steps. Um, in first, on the first step, we try to optimize this lower bound um, by choosing better functions Q. And usually, if we can calculate the uh, conditional probability on the uh, missing data or hidden data Z, then Q to, to um, Um, should be given as p of z given x. So it, you will see later in the example of the mixture models that it's the exact formula how to choose q. Um, well, in case we can't uh, uh, define q, we can. Uh, choose it somehow. In this case, this algorithm is called generalized EM algorithm. But anyways, always we need to maximize this lower bound. On the next uh, second step, after um, defining Q, as I said, this second term will be zero. So we should maximize only this the first term, which is the evidence law boundary, elbow, uh, with respect to parameters theta. So this algorithm was introduced in the 50s, and um, the convergence was started in this paper in 1977. But unfortunately, there was a mistake in the proof and it was covered uh, in this paper. I don't know why people discovered this mistake only after six years. It looks weird. Anyways, so sometimes um, people publish papers immediately. Sometimes it takes several years. <laughs> To probably they just didn't read this paper. <laughs> they used the algorithm without um, taking care about the theorems of, 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 um, of convergence. I don't know. Anyways, uh, there is theorem about convergence to the stationary points. But of course, no, um, there is no conditions for, con for global convergence. Okay, <clears throat> um, let's uh, move ahead. I want to show how to use this algorithm for mixture models. And um, 
I will finish for today. So, okay. Probably it will take five, um, well, a little bit or 10 minutes. Now, uh, let's consider the mixture model. The mixture model is given by this um, probability. So we assume that we have, well, probably you have seen this notation pi times p, where pi are the coefficients of the mixture. But um, I want to clarify this. So we introduce the hidden variable z, which says, which is uh, the um, categorical distribution, and it assigns the probability to each class. And um, we have the distribution of our data point given class. And um, also we need to know the distribution of class. What I should mention in the before that I didn't mention, but that is really important is that this um, functions q were introduced here for each data point x i so we don't have the distribution in general q of z but we have n capital distributions q for each data point z okay So here I define the probability for one data point, but uh, later we will see that uh, we also have n capital data points. So we will have also n capital uh, Latin space distributions. Okay, then. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if we denote the so this pk pk pi k also should um, we will have another index i for data point later uh, so we have this um, model for our uh, incomplete probability which we will optimize so on the e step which we we had this formula, you remember, we should take the, the distributions Q as conditional distribution Z given X. And in case of mixture models, it uh, has this form. Um, the joint distribution, which we can write using this, um, conditional this uh, definition over um, p of x which is marginalization of the numerator over z so this uh, will give us uh, the distribution on z and on m step um, Okay, yeah, here I wrote for E I point. And on A on M step, we use this Q defined on the previous E step. Um, and uh, they don't depend on um, theta now. And maximize the lower bound. Uh, and um, we can um, also 
notice <clears throat> that logarithm of the fraction is the difference of logarithms and if q doesn't depend on theta we can just um, don't take it into account so we have to maximize this expression and if we use the um, conditional definition uh, then we can split this logarithm into two logarithms so we will uh, maximize this uh, function this function in case of mixture models and finally <clears throat> i will show i have just two slides left <clears throat> the example for gaussian mixture which is the classical example so in case of gaussian mixture for a given class k the distribution of data point x is given by the uh, gaussian distribution with unknown parameters mu and sigma. So our theta is now the vector of these parameters. But also it will contain pi k in, in this case, this, uh, this pi. So um, <clears throat> on E step, we have these formulas for distribution over classes qk for given point i and on m step <clears throat> we should maximize this function <clears throat> but now we have the explicit uh, formula for this uh, probability x given z <clears throat> and uh, let's just substitute it uh, and uh, then we'll <clears throat> jungle with this logarithm this log of exponent will cancel log and exponent we will get um, this uh, um, quadratic form and so on. And after that, um, so we will get the function of mu, mu, sigma and pi. And we will need to optimize this function. So just use the standard methods of optimization, uh, like branch multiplies and then derivatives. To find out these um, parameters pi, mu, and sigma uh, using these rules for matrix differentiations and so on, but it's uh, straightforward then. So I think uh, every course of machine learning has these formulas but not every course explains how they were obtained that's it from me and if you have any questions feel free to ask yes thank you very much Anton, for a great presentation um if anybody has any questions uh please feel free to ask now you can feel free to unmute Okay, I guess I have a quick question. Um, that last example with the mixture of Gaussian, that was an example of EM being applied? Uh, of EM applied to mixture models. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, because initially I gave the algorithm, the general algorithm, then I used the more specific uh, um, model, the mixture model, and um, I provided formulas for um, when we have like different classes. And mm -hmm. then uh, using the Gaussian mixture, we have the explicit uh, expression for probability, we can use it. But exactly in the same way we can use 
the mixture of PCAs, we can use the mixture of um, what else? Well, of uh, for example, um, la, what is I forgot this distribution? Uh, not not high, but um, very common distribution with heavy tails, the Laplacian distribution. So we can use the mixture of different uh, models. Okay. But uh, um, <clears throat> this is just only one application of this algorithm. The other applications that I didn't have time to talk about is the Bayesian um, by, by, by approach when we um, introduce the prior on our uh, latent variable. And then we want to uh, find the parameters of this prior. So, but in Murphy, they, in, in book, they mentioned this, but uh, the general idea is always the same, just probability will have three terms instead of two, instead of P of X given Z times P of Z, it will have P of Z given parameter phi times P of phi, for example. But uh, I think the most important to understand the uh, idea. Yeah. I was um, still being surprised by how much math there was in the, in the book. Um, I mean, it doesn't bother me because I was a math major but I know a lot of people come into the field of machine learning with a programming background. Um, and I, I guess I was, I was just surprised uh, by the- uh, I, I, I would say that I didn't use the approach in book or every time when I see EM algorithm, I see Jensen inequality. But, uh, well, of course we can use Jensen's inequality, but then we, hit, we skip the general the whole uh, series of steps, because um, the main idea, I, I will bring back, I didn't mention that, that this bound is exact bound. Uh, wait a second, I will share screen. Because, uh, sorry, I didn't mention that. When we, you, when we have this uh, estimation for the likelihood, then it's very important um, um, probably uh, it's even earlier. It's um, not probably no, it's the call of explain here. It's very important to understand that there is such function Q that we have exactly equality signs here. Because if, if we have the lower bound like a kilometer below, it doesn't make sense to optimize this. It's, of course, it will be lower bound, anyway. but, but a huge amount of papers and um, I don't know the um, internet articles. They don't care about it. They say we will use Jensen's inequality. <laughs> yes, Jensen's inequality will give us the inequality, but they don't care about the exact boundary because <laughs> if we optimize function much below the target function, well, we do something. Yeah, the value is go, goes up, but we don't find the maximum of the target part. Right, right. So this is uh, the crucial thing uh, <laughs> to understand that um, if we use Q as the conditional distribution, then the second term is exactly zero. And uh, if we look at the first term, if we use here inst instead of Q, the um, uh, Q of Z given X, or P of Z given X, 
then uh, we will get um, uh, we will get exactly p of x. Um, probably it's easier to see here um, when I was uh, writing. Uh, yes, so if we use as denominator um, p of z given x, we will get exactly p of x, our starting point. And this is the, uh, I didn't mention, but it's really important um, to mention here. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, so my my uh, my presentation was different from uh, the explanation in the Murphy's book. They used Jensen's inequality, and in my case, they always used these papers from 1970s um, when they used this Q capital of um, Q and Q prime, and it's difficult to to keep track of all these derivations of all these inequalities. But when we use this explanation, as I used today, just a series of the inequalities, then mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, it's easier to keep track of everything. And uh, yeah, probably we don't uh, split exactly because there is one term, it's called entropy, uh, another call, they call Q this capital. But um, it's uh, probably better in terms of understanding. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again for presenting. I guess we're going to wrap it up. Um, yes. And uh, we will be back here next week with a linear. I think linear models is the next um, section of the of the book. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a good night or a good day, depending on where you are. Bye-bye. Thank you.